Alright, welcome back to Retro Tech or Die. Today we're looking at this really classic iMac coming in at 333 MHz. I found this locally on the Facebook Marketplace. The original seller said it was fully working, it just didn't have a keyboard and mouse by the time I picked it up. Uh, fortunately, I have a matching keyboard and mouse in storage, so we were able to get this unit complete as is. Um, as soon as I picked it up, it had 320 megabytes of RAM and 6 gigabyte hard drive. We're going to do a couple upgrades to this. I want to max out the RAM, get a solid state hard drive in. And this, unlike the later iMacs, has a fan in it. So we're going to upgrade that to a more modern, quiet fan. But before we do any of that, let's take a look at the unit and see what kind of work we have to do. This was a surprisingly clean pickup. Obviously, the keyboard and mouse I had, so those were clean, but the unit itself looks really nice. Of course, it's missing the I.O. door, but pretty much every iMac from this era is missing that door, and they actually demand a premium if you were to buy a door in the aftermarket. There is a sticker on the left-hand side, but that will come off incredibly easy. Doesn't look like there's a lot of dust in the unit. I really don't think this was used a whole lot. Other than that, just the minor scratches on the outside case, it looks really, really nice. And on the bench to upgrade to this iMac, we have a Noctua fan, 512 megabytes of RAM, and 128 gigabyte solid state drive with the SATA to IDE adapter. Three screws get you inside the case and two get you into the motherboard. Really great design, simple and easy to work on. Now all we have to do is remove this cage around the processor and RAM module. There's a clip that holds the heatsink on and that pretty much holds the whole assembly down onto the motherboard. We have two sticks of RAM, one on the top, one on the bottom. Pretty easy to get to. We're just gonna flip these out and then we'll install our new RAM. Once we cleaned out all the old thermal compound from the top of the processor as well as the bottom of the heatsink, I applied new thermal compound and then put the heatsink back on. It's really important that you get all the old compound off and you have a really clean surface to work with. If any time you're doing this, if you do get any of your finger oils or any dirt on top of it, clean it off really good before you put that thermal compound on. Ideally, you should be doing this with gloves. Uh, I, I just didn't have any at the time. And of course, we cannot forget to replace the battery. This battery was dead on arrival, and fortunately, it did not leak. Otherwise, this would have been a much more extensive rebuild and cleaning process. If this is your first time getting to the hard drive in an iMac of this era, it may be a little confusing and awkward. Once you take the CD-ROM drive out, no, you have to push it back and then lift up. Then we can access the hard drive caddy. There's this wire holder that you need to pull out. It doesn't really seem like it does a whole lot. Take that out, then we'll have to unplug all the wires from the motherboard. This kind of frees up the entire caddy. And then what we're gonna have to do is we're gonna have to push the hard drive back and lift it up. This actually took me a couple times because there's a latched feet on the bottom that hold that caddy into the bottom of the cage. It does help if you look into the side and see the orientation of the clips, but once you push it back far enough, the entire caddy will come out. Pretty standard setup the way the hard drive is connected into the caddy, just four screws and the drive comes right out. When you're ready to install your solid state drive and your adapter, just verify the jumper setting matches what the drive was that you pulled out. After that, connect everything together, make sure it's snug, and put it into the caddy. I was only able to get one screw on to hold the whole assembly together, but I augmented that with some electrical tape, and I also put some electrical tape on the board itself just to ensure that nothing could short out once I got the case button back up. 
Once we get the hard drive and CD-ROM installed, it's time to reinstall the processor card. There's two connections that the processor card has to make to the motherboard near the back of the motherboard. That's where I'm pressing right now. Once those connections are secure, then you can put the heat sink onto the processor and then attach that little tension bar. That tension bar is the only thing that holds the heat sink onto the processor. So you wanna make sure that you get this right and it's sitting perfectly. Next thing we're going to tackle is removing the old fan. The old fan is actually attached to the bottom of the CRT by two screws. Take those screws out and the fan and its housing, it's that little perforated metal bracket, that whole thing will slide out. Unscrew the fan from the housing, just cut the wires, and then we'll get ready to install our new fan. I did have to solder the leads of the new fan on. There was no connection I can make. I probably put about some connectors on it, but I really don't see myself replacing this. This fan's gonna probably outlast anything else in this computer, and it's gonna be a marketable improvement as far as sound radiating outside of the case. Once we boot into an OS9 rescue and install CD, we can set our partitions and then do our first boot on OS 9.2.2. This was an adventure, and not one that was particularly enjoyable for the most part of it. Some of it is probably my lack of experience with early iMacs, especially the tray loading models. Uh, for the longest time, I was always under the impression that this particular one was just a tray loading uh, Bondi blue iMac without the infrared port, but the 333 megahertz is really part of the fruity colors, and this one seems to still fall in a really unique category, I guess. Um, one of the things I really didn't understand is apparently this version of the motherboard can only address six gigabyte partitions at a time. So when I threw in that 120 gigabyte partition initially, even though I had a smaller boot volume for OS 9, uh, it couldn't read, well, it would read the rest of the drive, but it became very unstable. Um, I noticed this anytime I was writing files or even playing games. It just, it would just lock up all of a sudden, and very hard lock up. At first, I thought it was the RAM, so you know, maybe I put in the wrong speed, or a lot of the RAM I have, I put in bags and I label uh, the details on it. So maybe I mislabeled something. So I started swapping out RAM and even swapping out known good RAM for this one. That didn't do it. I thought it was maybe my controller. I got a, a SATA to IDE controller, so I bought a few different brands off Amazon to throw that into the mix. That didn't fix it. I even swapped it out with another known good hard drive. Still unstable. Uh, as I was doing more digging, I did find out that, look, this only can address six gigabytes at a time. So I really didn't need a 120 gigabyte hard drive. I, I lowered it down through some trial and error, it looks like it can only see two six gigabyte partitions. Once I did more than two, it again got very unstable. So right now we have, I think it's a 60 gigabyte solid state drive in here. Uh, I'm only using 12 gigs of it to uh, six, gigabyte part, part, six gigabyte partitions, but that's, that's not the end of the world. Uh, it, it runs great, as you can see. Really, the only change of my philosophy for using this machine is I'm just burning everything onto a CD instead of having the ISO live on the computer itself. But with that new fan in here, this thing is quiet. I can barely even hear the CD when it seeks. Uh, overall, I'm very happy with this uh, rebuild. I, I think it looks great on the desk. Uh, you know, originally I was probably just going to put this on the shelf down in the work shelf, uh, keep it down there, long-term storage, but I, I think this is going to live in the office for, for a good period of time. Hey, thanks for watching this episode of RTOD. If you like what we're doing over here, please like and subscribe. Don't forget to leave a comment. 
we got two new things on the bench that we're going to see in some future episodes. First thing is this iBook G3. Uh, this is going to be a lot easier than this guy back here. We should be able to put a much larger partition in here and actually have some fun with this thing. This might turn into an almost daily driver. And finally got my hands on an Apple IIc. Uh, spoiler alert, this guy doesn't start up. So we're going to be doing some troubleshooting on this. Uh, it's going to be exciting because right now I don't have my oscilloscope. So we're going to just be uh, probing some traces and figuring out if we can get that guy working again. So yet again, thanks for tuning in. We'll catch you next time.